Our first reading this morning comes from Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. And you won't be able to get your Bibles open before I finish this, so just listen. <laughs> Train children in the right way, and when old, they will not stray. Good job, Don. Thank you. <laughs> and just so you know, the liturgist does not pick the scripture reading. That comes from me, so he wasn't trying to take a quick way out today. That was my, my doing. And now from Luke chapter 6, verses 39 through 49. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. And no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. The figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the, good, of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood arose, the river burst against the house but could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act like a man who built a house on the ground without a found, uh, built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, immediately it fell, and great was the ruin of that house. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to try to stand the whole time, but I'm bringing my backup stool just in case, right? So we all have that one teacher that we loathed or loved in our elementary and middle school days, right? I know I, know I had a couple. Perhaps it was that beloved fifth grade gifted teacher that kind of let us be a little free and learn how we wanted to learn and just roam and do what fostered our best learning by ourselves and through a little guidance, but not too strict. Or maybe it was the thirst and the love that our semi-crazy middle school science teacher had for sciences that instilled a desire and a learn, or a desire to learn and grow as a student. But to this day, I still cannot forget my first grade teacher, Mrs. Julek. Man, she was strict. I remember her rules, and I remember how stern she was with us when we got out of hand. And I remember she always had a muumuu that she would wear every single day. We must have had 180 different muumuus, because I don't think I saw two that were the same. Uh, she loved us, and she wanted us to learn, but she meant business when she said, sit down, be quiet, and listen to what I have to say. Yet, she taught me a lot. We're also, like many others, we can recall that one a teachable or memorable moment that we learn and recall from when we were young. Now, some have stuck with me for years. For instance, to this day I can recall my preschool days, funnily enough, by going to the cafeteria, by doing a jump-a-thon to raise awareness for heart health, and waiting every day for my mom to come pick me up uh, from her elementary school and take me home. And then progressing on to elementary school, I'll, I'll never forget it, it feels still like yesterday. Now, sitting in the back of the class, uh, this teacher, she was a great teacher, but her, her desk looked a lot like mine, a little disheveled and stuff all over the place in my organized chaos kind of way. And I had a bookshelf behind me to try to keep me in line from talking to other students as I was a talker, believe it or not, go figure, right? But I remember this day like it was yesterday. She had a painting on the board or a drawing on the whiteboard of a plant. And we studied photosynthesis, how a plant takes in sun and light, converts it into food, and then it gives off oxygen for us to breathe. 
I don't know why that necessarily stuck with me as vivid as it does, but it did. So these specific moments have molded and attached themselves to my memory. I can even visualize myself to this day of sitting there or waiting out on the playground for my mom to come pick me up. See, that's the true power of learning. We never know what little act we do or what words that we say will stick with someone. Which means we have to choose those words and those actions very carefully. See, ultimately, this is a great responsibility. Now, the biblical lessons for today, both of them, in fact, speak to this critical notion of both teaching and learning. And they show how impactful and important they really are to this day. So for starters, that extremely long Proverbs verse that we read, I had this profound statement, train children in the way they should go, and when they grow old, they won't depart or stray from it. This kind of reminds me of a rocket. And since NASA is so close, it's very apropos for this message and this uh, learning this morning. You see, when it goes to building and creating a, lock, a rocket and, and to ensure a great launch, a lot goes into the process. Uh, tests have to be done, mathematical and scientific, uh, preparatory work, you know, uh, cr- numbers have to be crunched, things have to be theorized. Uh, a rocket has to be built and constructed either from raw materials or materials that are sent in and put together. A test has to be, be performed. Training needs to be done. The materials have to be ordered, assembled, and tested. The weather has to be perfect. The time of day has to be ideal. And the course has to be set for which the rocket will take. All of this just to ensure a safe and successful launch. But once that rocket does launch on its launch day, and once it leaves the launch pad, it's very difficult to change the trajectory or the course of the rocket. So the same, I feel, could be said for children and grandchildren. Once they've been taught something, it's been instilled in them. Eventually, it reaches a point where those teachings are very difficult, if not impossible, to change. So as hard of a pill as that is to swallow, we can see how true this sentiment really is. Children at a young age especially are so impressionable. They soak up everything like a little sponge. They listen to what we say. They see how we act and what we do. So that's why it's paramount that we instruct them in a loving, responsible, structured, consequential, and graceful way. You see, how we teach children today will impact who they are when they grow older. Therefore, we need to instruct them in the home, in the church, in the classroom as best as we can. They're very moldable and open to learning. It is therefore our job as teachers or parents or Christian brothers and sisters and friends or grandparents to ensure that they receive the proper and appropriate instruction, just as the Bible has told us to do. You know, some say that your job as a parent is never done, right? Would anyone attest to that? And once you're a parent, you're always a parent. They always seem to come to their parents, no matter how old they are, what they need in life for advice, for wisdom and hope. At least I know I do from time to time. I'll go to my mother and my father for a counseling or words of wisdom or some advice, and I'll never follow it. No, I'm just kidding. I, I do usually, <laughs> I usually follow their advice. But they're still always my parents. And we'll still always be someone's parent or uncle or aunt or grandparent or great-grandparent, no matter what the age of the child might be. So as a result, we need to equip and kind of train ourselves and certainly expect this will just be the case. We are privileged to a life that involves lifelong teaching. So as such, we need to accept that privilege and uh, take it on as a responsibility and ensure that uh, we do teach and have those moments where we teach children or uh, even adults or peers or whoever and encourage this great moment of teaching and also of learning. You see, as a parent or as a grandparent or as a friend or uncle, teacher, what have you, a teaching involves a great sense of appreciation, of joy, and enthusiasm. Teaching others and having the opportunity to do so is certainly a gift. 
no matter what age the student might be, from birth to 103 years old. But people are never too young or too old to learn. As a result, no one is ever too young or too old to teach. So for us, it helps to have the mindset of both a teacher and a student as we go about this life. As we know that many students around us in the community or in our life are going back to school, we should try to keep that mindset with us in life. But it's also best if we keep those great qualities of the wonderful teachers we had and or the students we may have encountered over the years. So what to you stuck out to the be or what to you stuck out the most about your favorite teacher uh, growing up or one you have experienced recently in life? Was there some quality or some trait that that teacher did that really loved you and instilled a growth and a desire for learning in you? Was it, fact, was it the fact that they challenged you? Did they plant a seed for thirst of knowledge or growth on a particular subject? Did they teach with grace, with imagination, intelligence, or love? A similar way, what has been your favorite the trait of a good student, if you've ever taught? Even as a parent, or a friend, or what have you? Were they attentive, or good listeners? Were they diligent? Did they put what they learned into practice, none of which really describes me as a student growing up, but I know they're good traits for students to have. You see, all of these are good questions to consider when it comes to us taking that role of teacher or student in life. So the, the mind of a teacher is one that continually seeks to draw the best out of others and instill kind of a sense of purpose. And so we are tasked to impart our wisdom, our own love, and our hope for the ones in which we are teaching. Now, how many times have we said or heard our parents say, I'm not going to be like my mom or dad. I'm not going to teach or raise my kids the way they raised me. I'm going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to be like them. We say this because we feel we've recognized flaws or logs maybe in their eye. Or perhaps even we see the speck in our own. And yet we're determined to make a difference. You see, I believe that is at the heart of any true person desiring to teach. All the best ones want to make a positive difference in the world. One that's rooted in love and encourages a nourishment and growth. So as a true teacher, whether that's in a specific classroom, up here in a preaching capacity, in a home, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, or in a small group discussion, we all have a responsibility and an opportunity and an immense gift to teach, to shape and to mold other people. No matter what our role might be or what our age or their age might be. But that's the mind of a teacher. The mind of a student is one that continually seeks to, uh, to grow and to learn and to mature themselves. This is the mind of someone that's never quite satisfied in life and realizes there's more in the world that we can always learn. It's a realization that we don't know everything, and we can learn from other people in the world, at least in some way. It's a mindset of continual self-reflection and a desire for personal growth, but one that seeks to move past our own flaws and aid in the shaping and molding of a next generation, or maybe even the current one. It can be challenging to be a lifelong student, that's for sure with a devotion to committing our lives to desiring growth and to seek that growth, that means sometimes we might have to change. Sometimes we might find something we don't like or realize about ourselves. But what is key here are the words that we heard from Christ in regards to being fully prepared like a teacher and asking, why do you see the splinter in your brother or sister's eye but don't notice the log in your own eye? Meaning we all have flaws. We all make mistakes, but we need to take a good, hard look at ourselves and see how we can grow, and see how we can mature and how we can grow from that situation or what we can learn or take from it, instead of always pointing them out in someone else and saying, oh, look at that speck in your eye, when we have a log inhibiting ourselves. 
So at the heart of a healthy, successful, joyful, and love-filled life, there's a continued desire and thirst for the rest of our lives to learn. Likewise, that joy is reciprocated any time or any moment we are able to share that wisdom or knowledge with others that are willing to sit and listen. That's where the true gift of all of this really lies. The ability to both teach and to learn. Both are very life-giving and are essential to contributing our part to making this world or ourselves or others better. And that's why we place such a heavy emphasis on, on Christian education and education in general in the Presbyterian Church. This is why we have a preschool that works alongside us and among us and is so critical to the livelihood and vitality of the community in which we live. Those teachers, all the ones that were commissioned at the 9 o'clock service this morning, that truly care for their children. I know it. I feel it and I've seen it day in and day out in my years of working here. They love to teach. They love the children and they love making a positive, a foundational and impactful difference in this world and the life of a young child. Similarly, the Sunday school teachers that we have here at TPC devote their time, their energy, their passion, their love to teaching others about Jesus Christ and going through this whole Christian life together. And so that also is an immense blessing for us to have. Now sure, we could try to learn some things on our own by ourselves. There's YouTube videos and self-help books and all of that stuff. But it really is more fruitful when we do it with a teacher and other fellow students. We need people willing and able to teach, and we need people willing and able to learn and listen. I still won't forget the moments where I sat down with my grandparents. Uh, and I didn't really appreciate this until I was older in life, really, sadly. To sit down and listen to their stories. I hear what's on their hearts, hear what their life was like, and learn from them. You know, it's kind of funny. What I heard a lot was a life filled with pain, with suffering, with heartache, but a life that was also rife with hope, with faith, with appreciation and love and joy and fondness. But it took me having that moment to sit down and listen to what they had to say. It's a two-way street. You have to teach, and you can only teach if others are able and willing to listen. So I, I learned a lot from them when I took those moments of listening. And humbly speaking, they said they learned a lot from me, not because I was filled with immense knowledge or wisdom, but because I was just being myself. You see, we all have opportunities to learn from one another if we're willing and attentive. You see, one of the greatest gifts we've been given in this world, aside from life itself and, of course, God, is the opportunity to continually learn and to grow. It truly is a lifelong process. And it's one that can bring much enjoyment and fulfillment and richness to our lives. It's a gift that we're better off not wasting. In fact, if you look at most of the people that are thriving and enjoying uh, their twilight or their later years in life, you can frequently find the commonalities that they're all looking to learn and to grow. In fact, there's a gentleman in this congregation who goes to classes at a seminary, and he's um, up there in his age. I won't give it away, but he's retired. We'll say that. But he learn, loves to learn. And so we've gone through these classes together, and we teach one another, and we learn about theology and God and life. And still after, he was a teacher for his life retired and he still loves to learn. And so my encouragement to all of us here today is to teach what you know. As long as it's being received and not coming from a place of judgment, use what you know and use what you love to teach. And continue to have a thirst and a desire for learning. And ask those questions. The curiosity is at the heart of learn. So don't be afraid to ask. Our lives will be better off both due to both traits, that of a teacher and that of a student. 
And who knows what impression we might make on someone, young or experienced in years and life. Amen.